this is a picture of Madame Curie. Uh, uh, I think definitely one of my heroes. How many are we? Twelve. Oh, God. That mark. <laughs> of course, I'm looking forward to discover dark matter and hopefully make a change and and ultimately get also a prize for it. And the highest prize, that will be the Nobel Prize. The search for dark matter, especially now, is definitely a race. It has always been a race and it's a very tough competition. Here at the Gran Sasso National Laboratory, which is the largest lab worldwide for underground physics, we have created the most sensitive detector for dark matter search. This competition has actually fueled the progress that we have seen in the last 10 years, really. But you want to do it first, which is what I've been trying to do. We know what kind of signature we are looking for, because if that is the real particle, which explains the dark matter, then these damn particles must reach us even at this Grand Sasso lab sometime. So we have these Grand Sasso mountains above us to protect the sensitive experiment from this radiation, which comes from the cosmos mostly. Sometimes people wonder why we are taking longer than we promised or that we wrote or that they think. And I think maybe they don't realize how challenging the effort is. The Xenon people are really professors here and there, and each one has postdocs, young researchers, graduate students, undergraduate. There was no textbook. And thank you for coming to watch this documentary, where I really don't like myself as stigma. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the scenes, but. Uh, a lot of the things I said, of course, they all true, actually. So, <laughs> there is sacrifice, you know, you do. when you want to do something good, you have to give up a lot, no matter what you do. That's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next to... He has a lot of hairs. This, this is Patrick. Thank you for the introduction, Eleanor. I'm Patrick Adario, a research scientist at Triumph in Canada. Uh, but before that, during the making of this movie, I was a postdoc at Columbia University working in an intelligence group on, on Xenon. And I was also the, yeah, as you can see, I, I had much less hair then. I grew it out. I forgot to get glasses <laughs> for my new fancy job. Uh, but yeah, I was also um, the supporting actor, right. both literally and, and in the movie. But um, just really, that's the least I can do uh, for Elena. After we met maybe six years ago, I think. So I came to you begging for a job, I think, after my PhD. <laughs> and now and, we know uh, why. Yes, yeah, so I kind of kept it, um, kept it on, but I didn't really tell her the full story, but I had a two body problem, actually. Uh, my wife, who's in the audience here, yeah, she's a cosmologist at, uh, at Berkeley now, and all stuff. She, she pushed me to, to move to New York, because that's where she was doing her PhD at Columbia. And she said if I didn't get a job there, she would break up with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I was on my hands and knees in front of Ella. <laughs> Please give me a job. And, and you were pushing the button in the movie. And yeah, so... Probably that, that scene is very complicated for the unblinding that... In the conference room in my lab, Patrick was the analysis coordinator as we look at the data that we have been taking for more than a year with that new detector and you were in charge of giving us the news. Yeah, so I can, I can expand on that, I guess. It wasn't fully explained in the movie, but you know, there are these nice shots of the, of the beach, uh, walking around the beach. Uh, it's kind of like collecting a box of sand, that's what we're doing with this, this big detector. And, and then we're trying to look for like just a few speckles of black sand, or dark matter, for example. 
but humans are they're very good. We have very good imaginations. We're very good at seeing things that are not there. We're, in psychological terms, a like confirmation bias. And so in order for the public to really believe the result that we put out, we need to prove to them, to you guys, that yeah, we're, not, we're not making this stuff up. And so we blind ourselves, basically. We put everything in the box, we close the box, we don't look at it during this whole procedure of collecting the data and analyzing the data. And we use our best psychic abilities. I mean, physics, physics abilities. <laughs> Predict what's inside the box. And only until all of our collaborators and all of our colleagues agree that we've used all of our best objective judgment on what's inside the box, do we open that box and then look at what's inside. Very nice. Yeah, it was uh, beautiful to see the Hudson River looking so spectacular in that beach scene. <laughs> Our neighbors to the north of Santa Barbara, oh, correct. And next, uh, uh, Patrick is an esteemed colleague, Dr. Kaishwan Nee, who joined UCSD, what, five years ago? Six years ago? Five years ago. Um, yeah, five, the time flies when you're detecting dark matter. Right. Kaishwan, introduce yeah. yourself, please. Okay, uh, is this working? No. 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 Okay. So. You might get that. All right, um, so you may wonder how I get connected to Columbia University uh, since I'm here at UCSD. Uh, uh, actually, I started uh, working with Helena about 20 years ago. Uh, that seems a long time ago. And I was a graduate student, and at the time, uh, Helena started her idea of using uh, liquid xenon to search for dark matter, and she allowed me to play with the detect called xenon baby only with one kilogram of xenon inside and I break PMTs and uh, you know, every night a night dream of uh, the, the detect will blow up, the pressure rise. <laughs> Unfortunately, after 20 years, I went to Italy or China look for dark matter and now we have the best detector in the world which have uh, two tons of liquid xenon. And I'll give you uh, a new one, eight tons. You know. Well, that's the good uh, thing about you know, working with the, the group. At a time, we only have about less than 10 people. I'm the first graduate student project. And now we have more than 100, more than 150 people around about 27 institutions. So UCSD is one of the collaborating institutions in this student project. And we worked very hard in the last few years uh, on Using the data collected from the detect in Italy, transferred to the US, and all our students work on the data for any signature document. So that's how I'm involved. Very nice. So, uh, Kaishwan, since you have the microphone, I'm going to turn everybody's attention to this table above my um, head over here. Point out that this is what the midterm will be on. So, you have to memorize this. So, this is made of spheroid table, the elements, now in its 151st year. And on the far right column, we see element number 54, which is xenon, which plays a huge role in this, uh, in this talk. I want to talk about my favorite element, number 97, named after me, Brian Keating. Uh, <laughs> then there's element 102, Nobelium. I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we go along. But first, uh, Kaishan, since you have a microphone, you're so uh, learned about this. Can you explain what is xenon and why do we even care about it? What, what's it used for? I think you look why it's a xenon. The far right column is all this noble element. You, you might very, we don't react very often with the uh, elements around. Um, that's why the existing in case is one. Uh, helium is like one, and the radon is the heaviest one. Xenon is kind of heavy, and it exists in the air at part per million levels. You can extract them from the air and get a very pure xenon. Um, you may want a large cost. Um, about $2 million per ton, and the wealth production is about 16 ton, 60 ton per year. Uh, so xenon, it turns out, you can easily purify the xenon uh, to remove all the radioactivities, the impurity inside to a very low level, part per billion level, and make it ideal for document detection. Because we want the, the material that we use to detect dark matter to be very clean that no trace of it can, can mimic the dark matter signal. So that signal is one of the best elements for dark matter. And Alina, how did you come up with the idea for this experiment? 
come to you in a flash of genius, of oh, right. inspiration. Nothing comes. <laughs> you have to think up. No, I started my research in Colombia after the post of at Harvard. And again, the connection is with this mentor, because Carlo Rubio was interested in liquid argon as a detector medium and a target for neutrinos and other rare events. So my early career in physics was about playing, not like I shine with Cuisine, but with the uh, novel as well argon. So liquid argon detectors. And when I left Harvard... Maybe I can't just say one word. How Rubio got the Nobel Prize. Not because he worked with the no, argon detector, but because something else. What? So, for the WNC Bosons doing an experiment at CERN, but he got interested when I was a summer student in this liquid argon technology to detect rare events. Um, and still, actually, that technology of liquid argon is at the basis of the big neutrino program in this country. We have a future project where we want to send a beam of neutrino from Fermilab. Uh, to South Dakota for, for following up on the nature of the neutrino. So it goes back to then, after Harvard I went to Colombia and the interest then was to, my interest turned into gamma ray astrophysics. So looking, going back to Margaret Burbage, where all, we have made, all the elements which make us and everything you know are made in the stars. So I was looking for activities in supernova and nova with a detector, which I propose to NASA to be a liquidine and time projection chamber. So the purpose was different, it was not for the rare dark matter particle, but it was also for uh, rare events or finding or imaging the gamma rays from the supernova explosion and identify different elements. So when, when the issue of the dark matter became more and more uh, known to me at least through a conference I went to so much, I, I discovered, hey, maybe my technology, this detector that I'm working for, NASA, would be very interesting also for this program. And that's when the proposal for the Zenon experiment was put forward to the National Science Foundation. So that's how I got into that. Fantastic. And um, Steve, before we turn it to the audience for their uh, questions and comments, and alternative speeches. I would like to ask, <laughs> like, what, what, what inspired you, and we hear it heard about inspired Alan, but what inspired you to want to make a movie about, you know, people that aren't, you know, there's no joke about scientists. How do you know a scientist is extroverted? They look at your shoes when they're talking to you instead of their own. Admittedly, <laughs> 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 some of us are guilty of that. <laughs> what gave you the confidence that this would make such a dramatic uh, a dramatic person made, as is, in my understanding, is a necessary element of a film such as this. So one thing about filmmaking is it is a, a license, kind of an unlimited license to pursue your, your own curiosity. Um, and I made a number of, I, I've been, most of my career has been in tech and entrepreneurial things in tech. <laughs> Um, but uh, I got into film, I guess maybe my friends thought about my midlife crisis or something, but you know, I, I left the, the tech world and, and so I was going to make a movie. The first films I made were for arts and culture. The first one was about Burning Man, the founders of Burning Man, so evidence that it was absolutely midlife crisis. But then I realized that, they, 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 as I got to learn the, the art of documentary, um, uh, I realized it really was a platform to pursue things that I thought were important and I cared about, and science is something that I always cared about, and this sort of grand human quest, this search for truth, and what does it all mean, uh, I, it's something that I cared about ever since I was a, a, a little kid, but I, I sort of got lost in a sort of tech uh, rat race and didn't really have the chance to pursue it, until some of my friends uh, up in Silicon Valley said, Steve, why don't, why don't you make a movie about physics? Well, you studied physics, but not, not <laughs> I really know what to do. But, um, but I, I, it was, it, it, uh, the friend of mine Craig, basically said, look, if you want to make a film about physics, um, how would you approach it? And I said, I would look for the, the greatest kind of mysteries of today, and I would look for where is that threshold of potential, you know, potential threshold where if it goes one way, 
it will change everything. If it goes another way, it will also change everything. But where's the threshold of the next paradigm shift? That's an interesting place to explore. And the exciting stories of physics that we tell in the past are all from people who were on that threshold and saw things differently. And I just said, well, where? I would go out to all these places like this. I have a picture of Elena's lab on my little treatment that I wrote. And I said, I'm going to go to the underground um, labs, and I'm going to go to the top of the Atacama Mountains in Chile, and I'm going to go to these grand places that are on the, on the, the edge of where we're searching for truth, and I'm going to meet the people there, and I'm going to see what happens. But, I, but my belief was that it would be that we would find these sort of, kind of pivotal threshold questions of, uh, of, 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 of nature and of the, potentially the next paradigm shift and the next uh, way of seeing things. And that's what we look for, and that's what we've we done. Yeah, remarkably successful. So I want to open that uh, for questions or discussion topics. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to around the room. I think there are enough microphones for you to talk about. Say, but that's it indirectly through a secondary action. <laughs> <laughs> you want to answer? No, there is no secondary action. The secondary action is going to be going to find you in another atom. I mean, the, the most critical aspect of this, we're using Lipizine as you heard, and so we can talk about how we detect it because it's not explained in the movie. But the, that's one detection, and the reason why we believe Keshran said why Zenon is so good as a, as a target, uh, there's a lot more than we can say, but for, instead of a secondary reaction, to me the most important from convincing evidence is going to be that if we find the signal in our detector, if it's coming really from the dark matter particle which fills the halo of this galaxy in which we live, it doesn't have to see Zenon as a special atom, every atom should see or feel the interaction with this particle the same way. The problem is that not every atom of every uh, material is a good detector medium, so I'm not going to make a detector out of water because we don't know how to get signals out of this water, for instance. Liquid argon could be an alternative detector uh, material, germanium, silicon, so there's many, many experiments based on different technologies which are searching for, for dark matter. And you asked how we look for it? One of you want to say in simple terms? I like the younger people. <laughs> so, um, as I mentioned, there are several other experiments looking for dark matter using a similar way as we do, um, but the technology is not uh, advanced enough that make a more sensitive detection than the Xenon cannot we develop. So that's why this second quote is the typical direct detection dark matter is uh, so far replaced the best way. But there are alternative models of dark matter uh, that can be searched by other techniques. For example, axions. Axion is a very light uh, dark matter uh, candidate, unlike the, the weakly interacting massive particle, very heavy candidate we are looking for. And axion can be actually be converted into a photon in a strong magnetic field. So if you have a very uh, pure cavity and you can create a very strong magnetic field, then the next thing I just go through that, produce a photon. And if you have a photon, very sensitive photon detector, you have that axion signal, then you can find this alternative dark matter. But that's a different kind of dark matter model, so many people are working on that. And I want to just remind folks that the film is available for download on iTunes, YouTube. There it is. Oh, and port. So there should be a war for you guys. I said they've got a good career. Wait, wait, wait. 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 We are searching. We are making it better. But I agree that we should get every... It was one of the big questions that you get all the time. How do you feel? Yes, it was depressing in that moment, but you get up very quickly and I keep fighting because you believe in what you're doing and we don't have any reason so far to, to know which way to go. We really don't know where to look. Eric Ferlinden might be right that we need to modify the theory of gravity 
and we don't need to search for any particle. But there are many, many reasons, and I don't want to bother you tonight, why we believe that the particle dark matter is, is a potential very good answer, and somebody has to look for it. So every time that we fail to find it, as uh, Bichman said in the... The only mistake you make is not to look for. And it, it takes all the data. The worst case scenario is not that we don't find any new particles. The worst case scenario is that Jill Theorist raises her hand and says, ah, the reason you didn't find new particles is because you didn't do the right type of analysis. You didn't keep the right events. That would suck. You never lose sight of the larger picture, which is that we are part of decades, centuries, generations long project to understand more about the fundamental underpinnings of the universe. You have participated in the collective scientific inquiry of humankind. So we keep looking, and every time that we don't find this particle, it just means it is much more rare, the interaction with normal matter that it, it has is much more rare than what we even dream of. And so we need to be even smarter and bigger and make things even more quiet or less radioactive, if you like, to look for it. So we still have quite a way to go, and we are building the next experiment, as Keshwan said, with 8,000 kilograms or more of xenon. The largest we, I never dreamt about going that big. But so in order to increase the chance that we have to eventually detect one of these weakly interacting mass with particles, we mentioned the name in these wings. How long have you been looking? But right now it's more than 10 years, almost 15. But that's nothing. For, but part of the film that they, that they didn't show tonight was the search for um, gravitational waves. And that was a 40 year long search. Imagine if 10 years in they had uh, said, oh, I can't yeah, find it. So anyway, we didn't care. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm wondering what, what do you think might happen if the dark matter hits the xenon? And how do you detect it? Well, I should say something because Kashman will help you to be absent. So I try to say it very simply. So Xenon is a normal gas up there. So we live to minus 100 degrees C or so. It's not that cold, but it's cold. So we liquefy this gas so that when it's liquid, it's three times heavier than water. So it's a dense liquid. And so being a liquid, we need to contain it and it's cold, so we need a thermos. So imagine. We have the so-called cryosets, so we put this 8,000 kilogram of xenon in liquid form into a thermal uh, thing, into a cryosets, vacuum insulated, insulated to keep <coughs> insulated to, because it's cold. And so what happens is that if this particle that we call a wind cares to scatter off an atom of xenon in my detector, what will happen is that the the scattering produces, releases a tiny amount of energy in this collision, and that is the energy that we're looking for to measure. The way we measure that energy is because whenever you have radiation in a medium, you actually see the radiation in different ways. For instance, we, what we look for is flashes of light, scintillation light, which is produced because these atoms get excited, the atoms of xenon, which are heat by this particle get excited, not in the sense of the excited that you can think of, but so sort we of form excited states, and through the de excitation of these states, we have scintillation photos, we have flashes of light, and we use appropriate photo detectors to see this light. This is the main signal that we're looking for, let's say, as a proof that there was an interaction in the liquid demon. But of course, many other particles can do the same, and that is the holy grail here. We are looking for that little black sand thing, brain, as Patrick said, because the interaction that we are looking for are very, very rare compared to the billions of interactions that cosmic rays, neutrons, radioactivity produce in the same detector. So our goal is to search for that tiny, uh, for that rare event in this sea of background. Nice. Could somebody explain for Leonard's theory? He said it so quickly in the movie that I didn't really grasp it. It's not very clear, it's very complicated, but he's still working on it. So I have to say only that 
Berlin is still is not complete, so he has put forward the basic idea, but he's still trying to spiral out different issues that he has, because a new theory has to be able to explain all the phenomena that we see, including the cosmic microwave radiation of this guy is nicely looking at me. That's the reason. So Ferdinand Steele, as far as I know, cannot still explain, or yet explain, this presence of cosmic microwave vector radiation, for instance. So he's still working on it. I can't explain it. The, the, the lay version of it is that he doesn't believe that gravity is a fundamental force, but it really is more like a pressure that emerges from something happening at the quantum level. So he's built this whole theory around that. It, it, and sort of deriving the Einstein theories of gravity from a different, a different way of thinking about it. But in his way of thinking about it, it doesn't need dark matter to explain the, at least the galaxies that he's observed so far. There's only 33,000 out of however many hundred billion there are out there. Right. So, dark matter is in this room. <laughs> and I assume in your Zenon. And then, it's, and then basically um, it's a unit one in the local around the solar system. The density is about 0 0.4 to 0 point, uh, about 0 0.4 and mass of proton per cubic second. So now you think this is very uh, you know very little right compared to the density of water in one gram per cubic centimeter. But since uh, the, we are keep moving in this sub uh, halo the earth, that it had to keep moving its halo, then the, the billion dark matter particles are passing through your body every day. But the way interact, so the physics are pass through your body. The same thing, it will pass through the mountains that uh, shield the cosmic rays and go into the underground that in Italy and get the signal detector. Now the difference is in that signal detector you can write the signal as I mentioned, but here we cannot register the dark message. So it's, it's everywhere. That, that's actually a very good question. I wish, <laughs> I, wish um, I would answer that question one month later um, because we are struggling with uh, some faint mystery signals you know, detected right now. And we're thinking whether this is the dark matter or some other unknown particle. And that unknown particle means uh, some standard model particle that we already know. Um, and if uh, we exclude that possibility, then we can confirm that it's a dark matter. So, um, indeed, it's very challenging. And our detector records uh, how many events per second? The normal five events, about five events per second. But the, these events are just from the surrounding radioactivity, the, the known, we call known background. And uh, after one year running, we didn't see any dark matter signal. Um, that's all the five seconds, five minutes a second, not by the, how many seconds in a year. So most of the events we record in the temperature is from the known background. And we understand in, a, in some level, in, in not 100%, but 99.99% level. So we have to understand all background, and two, we can. Say confidently that now this event is coming from the planet. So, first we can understand you will know that. Okay. And uh, seeing no events, sadly, this one has to come to an end for another midterm coming up. Uh, <laughs> that's how we professors make our living after all. I want to thank the panel. I want to thank uh, Stuart Wolfgang for being here. Thank you.